Legacies of Lure is a new card game that has recently wrapped up its initial Kickstarter. It is a really well designed card game that I was especially impressed with. It has a robust, easy to learn, and strategically deep rule set, all with a very high skill cap. It has a strong commitment to card balance, and its distribution model already anticipates a way to patch strategies that end up more dominant than intended with minimal pain to the players. There are many interesting aspects of it that I could make entire videos about on their own, such as its use of a hex grid play area, as opposed to a more traditional field of play, its blend of inspirations ranging from traditional TCGs to real-time strategy and MOBA games, and how this makes the game feel both fresh and new but also accessible and intuitive, and the game's decision to make no randomness a central feature and selling point. However, I want to feature on the one decision the game has made that is most relevant to this channel. Although Legacy of the Lure is an expandable card game, it is not a trading card game. To start with, it's worth it to clarify exactly what a trading card game is. A TCG is a game with semi-random access to cards distributed primarily through booster packs that contain an assortment of cards from a given expansion at varying rarities. What this ends up meaning is that even if players open boosters from the same set, they are likely going to end up with very different card pools to build their deck around, with a little bit of overlap in the commons and very little overlap in the very splashy rares that are likely going to be centerpieces of their deck. What this difference in access and card pool also leads to is players swapping cards back and forth to attempt to maximize what their random card pool is able to craft into a powerful focused deck. This is the trading aspect of trading card games. While random packs of cards have existed for well over a century, the first game to be really built around this distribution model is Magic the Gathering, and there have been many, many games created under this model since then, many of which have been featured on this channel. As anyone who has played a TCG will be able to tell you, there are a few big disadvantages of the TCG model. First and foremost, the interests of the consumer seem fundamentally opposed to the interests of the publisher. The consumer wants to create a customized deck that is competitively viable and then more or less keep it as it is, with only minimal upkeep and occasional upgrades. Meanwhile, the publisher would much rather not see occasional upgrades and would much rather see constant upgrades, since the publisher is bearing the costs of constant development of new sets, creating new cards, testing those cards, and then paying for their art and printing. These are all intimidating upfront costs for the TCG model, and it's difficult to imagine a publisher shouldering these costs if the player is then able to look at this new expansion and then promptly ignore it. TCGs will generally manage this disconnect in two ways. The first method is format rotation. Well, formats for all cards can certainly be allowed to exist. The commonly supported formats for organized play and casual support are focused more on a limited card pool of sets released within a recent time frame, such as the last two years for Magic the Gathering standard format. Older cards are simply not legal for play in these supported formats, forcing players to update their decks on a regular basis and enforcing buy-in for new sets. The other option that games can pursue is power creep. By steadily escalating the average power level of cards, older cards will be left behind by new releases forcing players to buy into new cards in order to remain competitive. Magic the Gathering has traditionally focused on format rotations while Yu-Gi-Oh! is the poster child for power creep, but often games will end up employing some mixture of both. In either case, as the publisher attempts to cover their costs by ensuring players acquire constant buy-in, the end result for players is a dramatically expensive game, as they are being forced to continually reinvest in order to remain competitive. The booster pack distribution method also adds another complication. Sets need to be a certain minimum size in order to preserve ratios of commons to rares. This sets a hard floor on the amount of resources that are going to be spent on creating new cards, testing them, and then paying for art in any given expansion. These upfront costs are going to be intimidating for any game, but with the minimum set sizes of TCGs, these are especially expensive. The higher the upfront costs in a game, the more sales are going to be needed in order to sustain a game's release, making TCGs somewhat complicated to sustain. This has a knock-on effect on the release schedule of trading card games. While TCGs theoretically have plenty of freedom in how frequently they release new cards, realistically all TCGs are going to fall into a similar range of 
four, five, or six mainline releases a year. In order to keep the game fresh and exciting and to constantly shake up stale formats, TCGs release on a fairly rapid schedule. They need to do this in order to drive player interest and investment in the game and to keep them buying new product regularly to support the high upfront costs of the game. Most TCGs therefore adapt a standard of 4 to 6 sets per year or similar as the optimal balance between maintaining player interest and investment without overloading player wallets or attention spans. Some games will release more than that, but they're often structured in such a way that players can ignore some number of releases. This is ultimately an unexpectedly rigid design constraint on what otherwise appears to be a very wide open game genre. TCGs are also incredibly tricky to balance. The regular release schedule combined with the massive pre-existing card pool and the huge amount of deck customization options that it provides players means that testing of new designs is only going to go so far for each new release. Indeed, in a large game like Magic the Gathering, players will collectively get more time playing with the cards of a new release in the first day of the release than the testing team did during the entire design process. This is coupled with the need to make high rarity cards actually feel rare, which can range from being unique to being highly playable and functional to being just outright powerful. Generally, safe, conservative designs of an average power level are going to be reserved for commons. This leads to a strong pressure to push the envelope on card designs to create cards that are powerful and exciting, but not overpowered or format warping or game breaking. It is a very fine line, and one of the most important skills of a designer is being able to create cards that walk this line, but given the pace of the design schedule and the pressures on card power put in place by the rarity system, it is practically an inevitability that some cards are going to find their way through at a much higher power level than was intended. In addition to being able to provide better balance and less costs, both to the publisher and the player, moving away from TCG distribution can give games more design freedom. Creating an expanding game that can fit into booster pack distribution can be an unexpectedly powerful design restraint. In fact, one of the main reasons that essential elements of TCG design are essential is that the amount of designs TCGs are required to produce. A game that is able to release new cards in lower numbers or on a more relaxed schedule can potentially allow for a functional, expanding game that can ignore one of the essential elements, or is able to reconfigure these elements into something that would otherwise struggle under a trading card game model. As an expanding card game that seems very strongly aware of these flaws, Legacy's Allure dodges most of these pitfalls. Using a non-random distribution of cards, they significantly reduce the amount of money players are required to invest in the game, but they also reduce the number of cards the game's creators need to produce for each new release. While the game's initial release is roughly 150 cards, which is roughly on par with a mid-sized trading card game set, their model leaves them with a lot more freedom to release either less frequently or to release smaller expansions down the road as needed. Because they don't need to provide high rarity cards, and hence they don't need to justify that rarity with pushed power levels or overly unique effects, they're much more free to focus on individual card balance and ensuring that the cards are roughly at the same power level as each other card in the game. It's worth noting that there's no real single element of the game that would prevent Legacy's Allure from being published as a trading card game. It's just that to do so would likely result in several design compromises that would ultimately drag down the game's design and the overall game experience it is trying to provide. The main disadvantages of the trading card game model is its upfront costs to publish, the ongoing and significant cost to players, and the design limitations and power balance concerns these costs impose on games using this distribution model. So on the flip side of all of that, what are some of the advantages of the trading card game model? After all, I wouldn't have an entire channel devoted to the genre if I didn't think there were some pretty strong pluses to balance the scales of these very significant negatives. The first and most obvious is the sheer depth of different card designs. In order to fill out a booster set, a very wide range of cards need to be designed, and the regular release schedule needed to maintain player investment on the level needed to keep the game afloat means that trading card games will release a ton of different strategies and individual cards. This gives players a massive amount of choice they can select from when deciding what to play. Deep card pools give expressive players tons of ways to express themselves through their card choices, 
and more competitive players are able to have tons of options to tinker with as they try to maximize the power and performance of their deck. While this is definitely a key feature of trading card games, other games can also offer similar large pools of game pieces and a high degree of customization. This is not only in games like Legacy's Allures, but also prominently in ECGs like Netrunner that have a non-random distribution. What separates trading card games from these games is the sense of ownership that players feel towards these customization decisions. Players in TCGs will only ever have a partial card pool to choose from, barring spending a ludicrous amount of money to collect playsets of all cards. Moving from random boosters to a finished deck requires a significant investment of time, effort, and, well, yes, money. While this can be cynically dismissed as a sunk cost fallacy and simply another tool trading card games have to force players to spend money, I think that this sense of ownership players have in their decks and collections is also an extremely important part in building player investment in the game, and not just at a financial level, but also at an emotional level as well. And although the trading card game can feel like a somewhat manipulative way of doing it, an emotional connection to the game you're playing is extremely important to the overall game experience. But the financial side of this is also a pretty obvious part of that, so let's just touch on that briefly as well. While the added financial cost of a TCG relative to other game genres is obviously great for the publishers who are collecting money from it, it's significantly less good for the players. However, the constant investment required of players in trading card games means that it is in the interest of game stores to provide ongoing support for the game, specifically in the form of play space. While other game genres will typically require only a single upfront investment to play, Trading card game players regularly spend money on their game of choice in the form of boosters, single cards, and sleeves and accessories. So, while there are many places where players are able to enjoy playing a wide range of different games such as board game cafes, in my experience no other genre of game has been quite able to fire the same level of store-supported tournaments and dedicated game nights on the level of a trading card game. One final advantage of the trading card game model with its large card pools, regular releases, and format rotation is that it forces designers to keep delving into the available design space of the game. Designers are forced to continually create new archetypes and strategies, which can often force them to explore designs that weren't even a possibility being considered during the initial creation of the game. The game doesn't slow down its development just because the gameplay environment is in a good place. This can lead to formats with unbalanced decks and miserable gameplay experiences, but they can also lead to an even better refinement of the initial game concept as releases are created. I mentioned that players in Agri will put in more playtime in a single day than designers can during the entire design process, but while this can make game balance difficult, it can also be quite a good thing. Watching the players play with the game after release can let designers observe what is working well in the game environment and what isn't. What aspects of the game players are really enjoying and making the most of, and what aspects of the game are generally disliked or ignored. Each new release gives the designers a chance to iterate on the initial game, and TCGs have a lot of releases. There is a lot of interest in the trading card game genre right now, but there are some important advantages to be gained in abandoning that distribution model, while still embracing the variety and depth of gameplay the genre promises. Legacy's Allure enjoys several benefits common to card games. It is a physical, non-virtual game that is highly portable, easy to set up and put away afterwards, and features a wide range of unique game pieces, each with their own unique art and identity. However, Legacy's Allure is also a game with a very strong sense of direction. It knows the gameplay experience it wants to create, and it knows that the TCG model ultimately is going to cause more problems than benefits to the game in delivering that experience. While they're trying to create a card game with a large number of different game pieces and possible strategies, they also want the game to be highly competitive and strategically deep, and in a game with no randomness, this demands exceptional attention to balance. They also are trying to avoid the high financial costs that TCGs impose on their players. TCGs offer a huge amount of freedom in the kinds of games you can create, but they also have their limitations. While I love TCGs, there are plenty of game designers out there that also love TCGs that are designing games that are not TCGs. In games like Legacy's Allure, or deck building games like Dominion, or drafting games like Sushi Go, these designers are taking aspects of trading card games that they enjoy 
and creating a strong game that captures the gameplay experience outside the design and distribution landscape of the TCG model. When you're designing your own game, even if trading card games are your main inspiration in the gameplay experience you're trying to create, it's worth paying very close attention to what exactly your own gameplay goals are for that game, and whether a TCG is the best distribution model to realize those goals. Sometimes it will be, but sometimes it might be easier to realize your goals outside of a TCG framework. For a channel based off of TCGs, this is clearly a pretty existential topic, so I am very interested in what everyone has to say. This is a huge topic, and I've only really touched the surface here. Is there an advantage or disadvantage to the TCG model I have overlooked? I'm also curious to hear from anyone working on TCGs, either as a designer or as their own personal project. Or anyone working at a local game store that runs TCG events or other game events, or even players who just enjoy TCGs or players who dislike TCGs and prefer other game genres. I'm very curious to hear what everyone has to say about this, so leave your comments down below and I will see you in the next video.